Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the final uh, plenary of the day, which is the session in tribute to Hans Rosling. So, a celebration, but also a very sad day to celebrate his, uh, to remember his passing. Um, uh, I, I got to know Hans ooh, a long time ago when Sheila Bird uh, invited him to speak in Cambridge before his, 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 his famous um, TED Talk video and really before he became very well known. And um, it was extraordinary. I didn't know who he was, but then he gave this presentation and uh, he had gasped and I uh, near sobs in the room from the emotion that he managed to get out of his, out of his plots. It was quite, quite extraordinary. And then I was pleased that when, 10 years ago at the RSS conference in York, we invited him over. And again, with his generosity, he gave a talk and was there and talking to people. Another wonderful performance. Um, but uh, I'm not going to talk about him. Uh, we're incredibly fortunate this evening to have Dan Hillman here. Uh, Dan is a uh, TV director. He directed me in the, the Joy... No, no, Joy of Chance. Science of Chance. Science, Science of Chance. Science of Chance. What, what was it called? Anyway, the, anyway in TV programme. <laughs> but, but really, he's also directed Hans, or worked with Hans, on a number of TV programmes, and so has an extraordinary experience of working with him in, in uh, production of these uh, working on communication, which is what Hans was so good at. Um, I should just explain, <laughs> there's, you know, there's going to be a lot of clips and technology, and it was all working fine at lunchtime, and since then, things haven't been working so well, I'm technically. So the, the pictures might not be in quite the right aspect ratio, and you may have to be a bit quiet uh, for the sound. The sound might be a bit quiet. Okay, so you'll, you'll have to hush during, the, uh, hush during the videos. But with that, I'd like to pass over to... Oh, thank you very much, David. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, on and off over the last seven years, yes, I was lucky enough to work with Hans Rosling to make three documentary projects for the BBC. Can you all hear me all right through this mic? Yeah. He became a dear friend as well as a colleague, and today I'm going to tell you a bit about his life, and I'm going to show you some clips of him in action, uh, talk a bit about what it was like working with him, but really do my best to explain um, that incredible sense of mission that drove pretty much everything he did. Um, and I'm gonna go straight in with a, with a clip. It's from about 10 years ago. It's from the very beginning of the very first of his many famous TED Talks. And for most of us, not David who met him before, but for most of us, myself included, this marked his first public emergence. So and this is where it began. About 10 years ago, I took on the task to teach global development to Swedish undergraduate students. That was after having spent about 20 years together with African institutions studying hunger in Africa. So I was sort of expected to know a little about the world. And I started in our medical university, Karolinska Institute, an undergraduate course called Global Health. But when you get that opportunity, you get a little nervous. I thought, these students coming to us actually have the highest grade you can get in Swedish college system. So I thought, maybe they know everything I'm going to teach them about. So I did a pretest when they came. And one of the questions from which I learned a lot was this one. Which country has the highest child mortality of these five pairs? And I put them together so that in each pair of country, one has twice the child mortality of the other. And this means that um, it's much bigger the difference than the uncertainty of the data. I won't put you at a test here, but it's Turkey, which is highest there, Poland, Russia, Pakistan, and South Africa. And these were the results of the Swedish students. I did it, so I got a confidence interval, which was pretty narrow, and I got happy, of course. I had 1.8 right answer out of five possible. That means that there was a place for a professor of international health and for my course. <laughs> But one light, late night, when I was compiling the report, I really realized my discovery. I have shown that Swedish top students know statistically significantly less about the world than the chimpanzees. <laughs> because the chimpanzee would score half right. If I gave them two bananas with Sri Lanka and Turkey, they would be right, half of the cases. But the students are not there. The problem for me was not ignorance, it was preconceived ideas. Uh, the whole talk is wonderful for those of you who haven't seen it before. Um, here in a nutshell was the mission that drove hands really from long before he ever became a public figure. A mission to fight in every way he could people's preconceived ideas about the world that were wrong. Probably Hans's most important formative experience professionally was when he went to work as a medical doctor in Mozambique. Here he is. Here he is, clearly a happy moment. 
It's 1979. Mozambique had just gained independence after years of war. Hans signed up to work for the new government for two full years as a rural district doctor in this little clinic that you can see. Here's a more serious moment. Uh, the area he covered was vast. He was responsible, in theory, for almost 300,000 people, many of whom lived in unimaginable conditions. And he not only saw diseases that could only exist in the conditions of the most extreme poverty, uh, he also had to deal with the um, terrible cruelty of scarce resources. For every sick child he treated at his clinic, he estimated that something like 50 others died unattended out in the countryside. And in the years that followed, Hans travelled to other countries in Asia, Latin America, elsewhere in Africa, uh, as he continued his work in public health. But crucially, it's because he'd seen firsthand the extremes of poverty in Mozambique that he was equipped to notice the real differences between places that were still all lumped together as the third world, or slightly more politely, the developing world. And he began to see that this lumping together of so many different places, some of which were, really which were really changing fast, was not only blinding people to the real progress he saw happening, it also meant they kept seeing the world as static and believed that real progress wasn't even possible. And so Hans, never one to duck a challenge, set out to change people's preconceived ideas about the world. Here he is in the 1990s, now a university professor teaching global public health in Stockholm. And he set up a little foundation called Gapminder to pull together hundreds of data sets from the United Nations and from national statistical agencies all over the world and to develop visualisation tools to bring this data to life. I hope later on that you might, if you haven't already, go and watch some of the dozens of fantastic hands talks uh, you can find on the internet. But for now, here's a little montage of a few more bits, plus a couple of bits of him talking about his visualisations. So we did this software which displays it like this. Every bubble here is a country. This is uh, China. This is India. The size of the bubble is the population. And I'm going to stage a race here between this sort of yellowish Ford here and the red Toyota down there and the brownish Volvo. Uh, the Toyota has a very bad start down here and United States Ford is going off road then and the Volvo is doing quite fine. This is the war. The Toyota got off track and now Toyota is coming on the healthier side of Sweden. That's about where I sold the Volvo and bought the Toyota. And <laughs> This was a great leap forward when China fell down. It was central planning by Mao Zedong. China recovered and they said, never more stupid central planning. But they went up here. No, there was one more inequity. Look there, United States. Oh, they broke my frame. Washington DC is so rich over there, but they are not as healthy as Kerala in India. It's quite interesting, isn't it? I still remember that second when I saw the first bubble move smoothly and I saw the beauty in the movement, you know, that it really moved and I could see the year pass by. It was like seeing an x-ray from your own body. You knew how it was inside here, on MR, and then suddenly it was there in front of your eye. Okay, I give you Singapore, the year I was born. Singapore had twice the child mortality of Sweden. It's the most tropical country in the world, a marshland on the equator, and here we go. It took a little time for them to get independent, but then they started to grow their economy, and they made the social investment, they got away malaria, they got a magnificent health system that beat it both US and Sweden, and we never thought it would happen that they would win over Sweden. <laughs> Animation shows time as time. You know, it is so forceful not to show time on an x-axis. It never changed a mindset. I first started working with Hans in 2010. Uh, me and my colleagues at our production company, Wingspan Productions, had seen the talks he'd done at that point, to that point, and were completely bowled over. And we persuaded the BBC to commission us to make a programme to be called The Joy of Stats, with Hans as presenter. By this point, his international reputation was growing, and in a typical week, he'd be on three different continents, giving talks to high-powered audiences, anything from UN agencies to the heads of multinational companies. And he was a bit suspicious of us when we first approached him, and he didn't really trust us at all. And anyway, in the age of the internet, Hans regarded television as old media. And so was it really going to be worth his time? Well, he signed up because he knew the BBC brand meant school teachers would be more likely to download the programme after it was made and show it in their classrooms. And this was really his ultimate aim, to get to a new generation young 
and before they'd had a chance to form all those wrong ideas. And for the centrepiece of our programme, we made a special four-minute section that packaged up some of Hans's animations and gave them a new polish for TV. And the idea was to tell the story of the whole world, 200 countries, over the last 200 years. And here's the first bit of it. So, here we go. First, an axis for health. Life expectancy from 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth, income per person, 400, 4,000, and 40,000 dollars. So down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago, in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. The animated bubble graph is probably what Hans is best known for, and I want to focus on it for a minute. Um, and the one thing I want to stress more than anything else is how it was a very, very long evolution. Years of work went into it and into refining it. When he first started using bubble graphs in the 90s, uh, to teach his university students. He, they weren't animated. Uh, he used printed charts on pieces of paper. And it, was his, it was his son, Ulla, who worked out how to write the software to bring them to life. And that gap minder, they then iterated every detail many, many times over. Uh, Hans was evangelical about the iterative process. Uh, he'd, he'd often say, if you do something seven times, it might be okay. If you've done it 15 times, it'll probably be quite good. And, for instance, there was the algorithm calculating how big the bubble should look, a bit more complicated than it seems, because they didn't want any of the small countries to be so small they disappeared, so there were corrections built in. There was uh, uh, how the bubble should pass in front of or behind each other. There was how many colours to use for the world's regions, which by this point they would got down to five and eventually would radically simplify to just four. There was the position of the date. Uh, they come, came up with the idea of a huge number placed on top of the graph so that your eye doesn't have to dance around too much. And then there was the data itself. Um, some of the data, and for some countries, a lot of the data, particularly for the early years, just didn't exist at all. In fact, some of the countries in the early years didn't exist at all. But rather than have bubbles simply disappearing whenever there were no numbers, they felt their educational purpose would be much better served by showing something, even though it was artificial. And so they hired a team of economic historians to carefully research the best ways to fill in all the gaps in the time series. And of course, they published all their workings online. Hans liked to use an analogy to, to justify this. Uh, he'd say, imagine a museum uh, with a new fossil dinosaur to put on display. The only thing is, they've only got three of the fossil's legs. Um, what they should do is to work out what's the most likely way that the fourth leg looks and then make it out of plastic because there's nothing more ridiculous than showing a fossil dinosaur with three legs and even worse than that, even worse than that, it would be distracting for the people who most need to see it and understand it. Now when we came to adapt all this for TV, what we wanted, as you can see, was to have hands standing behind the graphics and looking through them towards the camera. Uh, to do this, we had to add all the graphics later in post-production. So for the actual filming, 
Hans was pointing at bits of gaffer tape stuck to the floor and the walls and the ceiling. And we broke it all down into lots of sections and did lots and lots of tapes, which fortunately he liked because that was part of the iterative process too. Uh, but he still didn't really believe it would work until you know, we'd finished it. And we put this clip on YouTube and it went viral. And lots of people watched the program. Lots of skilled ch school children watched the program. And finally, Hans decided that perhaps TV wasn't quite so bad after all. Phew. He was particularly passionate about the subject of world demographics. For one thing, it was bound up with all sorts of development issues, from infant health and child health to women's rights, access to contraceptives, that were all very important to him. It was also a subject ripe with preconceived ideas that needed busting. And so we turned to demographics for our next documentary with him. And I'm going to show you a couple of clips from this one. And this time we used an audience and we used a transparent projection screen so Hans could see the graphics. Uh, but we still made it quite complicated. Anyway, have a look. In 1963, the Can you hear? average number of babies born per woman in the world was five. But it was a divided world. Can you see that? These countries over here, the developed countries, they had small families and long lives. And then there were the developing countries over here. And they had large families and short lives. And very few were in between. But now we'll see what has happened. I start the world. Here we go. And you can see that. China is getting, the big bubble is getting to better health, and then they start family planning, they move along to smaller families, and the big green, look at Mexico, Mexico is coming there, and this is uh, Brazil also, the green in Latin America, and here India is following, India is following, the big red bubbles are Asian countries going this way, many Africans are still with many babies born per woman, and then Bangladesh over there overtakes India on its way to the small family, and now almost all go up to this bubble, even Africa now starts to move up, ooh, that was the earthquake, in Haiti, uh, and now everyone ends up there. What a change we have. By the way, the, the world average fertility rate, uh, many of you may, may know, I'm sure, but the world average fertility rate, the number of babies born per woman, is now less than 2.5 and still falling. Our main aim in this program was to explore the projections from the United Nations Population Division that showed that world population uh, is most likely to level off by the end of this century. And that was all down to, that's all down to those falling fertility rates. But also, from this data, Hans extracted what, for me, is his most remarkable single statistical insight of all, which is the concept of peak child. I'll show this by showing you the number of children in the world. The number of children from 0 to 15 years of age. Here they come. Look. Uh, uh, the number of children there increased slowly and then also it increased rapidly so by the turn of the century here there were two billion children in the world and to me that was an important year because that was when Doris was born that's my first grandchild and and she was born at a very special time for children in the world you know because the specialists the demographers estimate that from this year the number of children in the world will continue like this. It will not increase any longer. By the end of the century, we will still have two billion children in the world. When Doris was born is when the world entered into the age of peak child. I still find that mind-blowing. Um, I'm going to carry on with this because what he does next is, I think, his, possibly his best ever bit of educational theatre. It's his idea, not ours, I, I hasten to add. Now, this will confuse you, because how can then the total population grow like this if the children doesn't increase? Where will all these adults come from? And, and to explain that, I have to leave this fancy digital stuff and show you real powerful educational material we have developed. Huh? And it's here. I will show you the world population, ladies and gentlemen, in the form of foam blocks. One block is one billion. Huh? One block is one billion. And that means that we have two billion children in the world. Then we have two billion between 15 and 30 years of age. These are rounded numbers. We have one billion 30 to 45. We have one billion 45 to 60. And then we have my block, 60 years and older. We are here on top. Huh? 
Huh? This is the world population today. And you can see that there are three billions missing like here. Uh, only few of them are missing because they have died. Most of them are missing because they were never born. Because back then, you know, before 1980, there were much fewer children born in the world because there were fewer women giving birth to children. So this is what we have today. Now, what will happen in the future? Do you know what happens to old people like me? They die. Yes. There was someone here who works in hospitals. Yeah? <laughs> so they die. The rest, they grow 15 years older and have 2 billion children. These ones are now old, time to die. Eh? And then these ones grow 15 years older and they have 2 billion children. This one die and the rest grow 15 years older and have 2 billion children. And without increasing the number of children, without increasing the length of life, we have 3 billion people more by this big inevitable fill up of adults, which will happen just when the large young generations grow up. Now, there's one more detail, which is good news for the older ones here, you know, like me, that it's estimated that the old people will live a little longer. So, so we have to add one billion more for the old here on the top. And I'm desperately hoping that I will be part of that group, because then I can live long and read the annual statistic as they come reporting every year. Well, that's very sad to watch now, of course. Um, but I, I never get tired of watching that. And I love how he he would contrast high-tech animations with very low-tech props. Uh, other times he, he did this one with cardboard boxes. He wants to use toilet rolls to do it on Newsnight. Uh, he'd use all sorts of props for his talks to make various different points. I just want to go back to Peak Child. One thing about that Peak Child figure, two billion children, is of course that whatever the actual number of children yeah. there are in the world, it's almost definitely not two billion. It might not even not be that close, but Hans was very big on using simple rounded numbers. He felt very strongly that for educational purposes, only whole numbers, in this case whole billions, would do. And he, he also felt that using rounded numbers was often more credible for his audience. Um, because he knew there were, and he understood well, the many layers of data collection and statistical calculation that went into creating these figures from censuses in remote parts of sub-Saharan African countries all the, all the way up. And for many of the things he was interested in, by the time we got to the global level, he felt that too much precision was entirely spurious. In a way, I, th I think Hans's mission boiled down to identifying a very few key things about the world he wanted everyone to know and to remember, reducing them to their simplest essence and repeating them with enormous wit and panache and conviction over and over and over again. He lectured and campaigned tirelessly on so many aspects of health and development, but at the core, I think he had three key statistical messages. One, money. We no longer have a world divided into rich and poor, but a continuous world in which most people live in the middle. Two, population. We're at peak child. The world fertility rate is approaching an average of two child families and world population is most likely to level off. And three, living standards. For most people in the world, most things about their living conditions are gradually getting better. It wasn't fake news that concerned Hans so much as the way this real good news went unreported, partly because it was so hard to spot. And also, because in comparison to the daily news cycle, it was so slow moving. Even though the story he was telling was actually about the fastest improvement in living conditions in human history. And he loved to pick fights with journalists about this, especially on TV. Uh, I'm going to show you a clip I love. It's from Danish TV a couple of years ago. Hans is arguing with a TV journalist about the role of the media. It's in Danish, of course, but there are, are subtitles. It's terrific. Men det jeg tænker på set fra et medieperspektiv, ikke bare her i programmet, men medier generelt, det er jo, at, at mange medier vil sige, vi rapporterer om verdens tilstand, som den er, og lige nu er der krig, konflikter, kaos, uro øh, og, og en hel rand, øh, række andre negative aspekter. Det var, det var jo fejl. Du har jo fejl. Rakt op og ned fejl. Det var et fantastisk val i Nigeria. Demokratiskt val i Afrikas största nation, där en halvduglig regering ersattes av en mycket kompetent eh, 
eh, chef nu, Mohammed den nya, som får stöd från hela befolkningen. Det fantastiska valet som var i Indonesien förra året. De framsteg som är i Indien. Igår så förklarade vi att Indien nu är fritt från stelkram. Men Nigeria är fanget i en djup terrorkrig mot Boko Haram. Ja, en liten del av Nigeria. Inte resten. Nigeria har en snabb ekonomisk tillväxt och fallande barnadödlighet. Om ni väljer att visa ni om ni väljer att för mig att bara visa min sko, den är ju jätteful, det är bara en del av mig. Om du väljer att visa mitt ansikte så är det en annan. Så, så, ja, jag ska... Ni visar ju en liten del och kallar det för världen. Den stora skillnaden, att flickorna går i skolan, att barnen vaccineras, att de flesta har elektricitet hemma, att människor är kapabla och är yrkesfolk runt omkring i världen. Det är viktigt att visa, men det händer så sakta, så det kommer inte med ner. Vad ser du den vin på? Ja, men det är vanlig statistik som är sammanställd av Världsbanken och FN. Och det är inte kontroversiellt. Det här är ingenting som man kan diskutera. Jag har rätt och du har fel. I love it. I love it, I love it, I love it. By the way, the apples you might have spotted on the desk there were props that Hans was using to show the changes in world income distribution from two divided groups of apples to one big group of apples with most of the apples in the middle. <laughs> Hans was sometimes dismissed as an optimist, and it's a label he spent years fighting off. Instead, he liked to call himself a possibilist, and what he meant by this was that Once we see how much so many countries and people all over the world have already achieved, we can hardly dismiss the idea, we can hardly dismiss the idea that similar future change is possible too, whatever the challenges might be. And he felt it's even possible, perfectly possible in fact, that extreme poverty, like he'd seen years before in Mozambique and that still existed for one seventh of the world's people, could be eradicated altogether. And that was the subject of the third documentary we made together. All of this led him to a position that was both practical and deeply moral. Engagement with the world works. Aid, for all its faults, works. And that so many people have come out of extreme poverty already in recent years should give us the courage and conviction to keep working to help those who still remain here, remain there. Hans's life had one amazing penultimate chapter. Three years ago, at the height of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, he decided to go to Liberia himself to help fight it. Here he is, he's arrived at the Ministry of Health and 20 minutes later these Liberian epidemiologists have signed him up as their deputy. Once a week he would brief the president, seated here at the head of the table, about the situation. They made him an honorary chief. He was delighted. And, but what he did What he did there was to help to overhaul the system for tracking infections that was a key part of beating Ebola. It was a data collection system, data collection problem. And he gave new confidence to a team that had been overwhelmed by the crisis. He ended up staying and continuously working there for four months. And he only returned when he was sure that Ebola was under control and they had the systems in place to deal with any new cases that might emerge. When he came back, he gave a lecture in London about his experiences, and the last clip I'm going to show is from this lecture. It's from a bit about the very end of the fight against Ebola. And um, once again, I urge you to go online later and watch the whole thing. It's, it's fascinating. During the catastrophe, when we had the fire brigade out fighting, then we counted number. During this period, the second phase, when we had to go to zero, we didn't use numbers, we used names. We had to get to know people, we had to respect people, we had to gain their confidence. And I can tell you how this ended in Liberia. This is not my data, I presented it from the Minister of Health and many other people who have done the work. But all cases that appeared in Liberia in this year came from this one woman who got sick the 28th of December. And unfortunately she had not gained the trust and confidence in the system. So she stayed at home with her fever and her vomits and hoped that it was malaria or something else. And by doing that, unfortunately, she infected five other persons. So in the beginning of January, a neighbor developed Ebola, the son, the husband, a daughter, and a herbalist that she went for treatment. One person created in less than two weeks five other persons. And look here. 
The neighbor infected his sister and brother and also the niece. The son infected the brother. The husband infected six other persons. Nephew, daughter, two persons who helped him to a taxi in the end. And another neighbor here and a friend. So this is like a sinister family tree. Eh? The vir virus transmits in the closest relation you have in life. Those who help you when you are sick. From one to five to ten. But at this stage, the response had got it. They had gained the confidence. The best team there from the Montserrat or the Monrovia team came there. Moses Badoa and Musaka Fala led this work, you know, to try to gain the confidence. And they got the list of all the contacts and they followed the contacts. And the good thing with Ebola is that the first one to two days when you get symptoms, you are very little risk of infecting others. It's not completely safe, but the risk is very low. And if you just isolate people that the first one to two days, then you can stop the transmission. And what happens was this. This person who helped into taxi, he infected the health worker. This infected the fiancé. The nephew infected the wife. The brother here infected the housemaid and the sister. And the niece there infected her grandmother. And she got sick the 19th of February and was discharged the 5th of March. Because, now I will show you who died and who survived. All these which I show as black hair, they died. In the beginning of this micro outbreak, you know, they came late. And they also died to a very high extent. Here more survived. Out of these last six, it was four who survived and two who died. And then we thought it was the end. We thought it was over here. It was very nearly over. There was one more little micro outbreak after Hans got back, which the Liberians dealt with. And then it was over. <coughs> Last spring, Hans very sadly was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Uh, he retreated from public life to spend time with his wife, his three children, and his seven grandchildren. He expected to live only a few months, but um, was something of an outlier. He survived almost a year. I texted him very occasionally to see how he was, and I, I thought he stayed remarkably philosophical. One of his many mottos had been, you have to live your life in a way so that you can die in peace. And it seemed to have worked for him. Last autumn, he messaged me to say that he'd been planting tulips in his garden and had a 50-50 chance of seeing them come up in the spring. In the end, he didn't quite make it. He died in February at the age of 68. I'm going to finish now uh, by reading a few lines from the dedication of an award given to Hans posthumously by the United Nations. This award, they said, was in recognition of the power of his intellect and influence for human understanding and progress his dedication and unwavering commitment to public health and the eradication of poverty over three decades, for pioneering health research collaborations with universities and for his sterling leadership in championing international cooperation in health, for his remarkable quest and success in promoting increased use of data and a better fact-based understanding of the world communicated with his personal wit and humour, and above all, the iconic infographics developed to enhance the human visual system's ability to see patterns and trends from international statistics. I'm sure many of you here, like me, will miss him very much, uh, and I hope that, like me, he's been an inspiration to many of you too, and I'm sure he will be for a very long time yet. Thank you.